Today we're going to be talking about cybersecurity and artificial intelligence. I know a lot of you are interested in cybersecurity, so we'll give you a computer science perspective on this and with the artificial intelligence uh, entering into the, the scene. The concern for security in, in uh, computers is, is very old. It goes back to the 1960s at least. Uh, research in computer networks and operating systems made it possible for a large number of users to share a common file system. This enabled data sharing and at the same time demanded data protection. Ever since then, a major concern of operating system and network engineers has been mechanisms for giving users control over who has access to their information. The ideal was always considered something called least privilege which means no access or sharing unless explicitly authorized. Well, that sounds wonderful, but it turns out to be devilishly hard to realize. Password systems were not foolproof at keeping intruders out and only, in fact, gave them more ways to get in. Among the first attempts to thwart this uh, unwanted, the presence of unwanted users was called intrusion detection systems, which built statistical profiles of actions by authorized users and flagged users that deviated from their profiles. This type of mechanism, intrusion detection, was an early form of machine learning. Malware, which began as a new threat in the 1980s, became a plague in the 1990s as the internet connected more and more computers. Malware, as you know, seeks to steal private data, so everybody's trying to stop it. New kinds of protective machine learning are now part of antivirus software installed in every operating system, and as you know, it's not perfect. In the 2000s, last uh, 18, 20 years, search engines began to keep records of every search performed by every user and then attune the ads that you see on your screen to you. This was a way to keep search free, with quotes around the word free, and still produce revenue for the search companies. Soon after that, apps uh, vendors, apps developers, started doing the same thing. They collected data on the user action patterns and forward the data to a server and then in many cases, uh, sold that data to others to get advertising revenue. The data are used by machine learning algorithms to predict user responses and preferences and tempt them with hard to resist ads. Users have begun to react negatively to this, but no one has found a way to stop the tide of machine learning algorithms that users perceive as spies. The old principle of least privilege has been eviscerated by machine learning that can infer your private data from records of your actions. This concern has given a birth to a new research area, which I call, for want of a better term, cybersecurity in the age of artificial intelligence. Cryptographers have joined the fray, offering their knowledge of cryptographic protocols as tools that might restore user control about the use of their own data. Today's speaker to talk to you about this is Professor Britta Hale. Britta, come forward, please, uh, from the Computer Science Department. She's going to give you a picture of the new security problems and research that's aimed at trying to solve them. She joined NPS uh, about a year ago. She holds a master's degree in in Mathematics of Cryptography and Communications from the Royal Holloway University of London, and a PhD in the same area from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. She's been active in protocol design for the Internet Engineering Task Force, which provides standards for the Internet. She has worked in industry research on European nation-level security preparedness. So welcome, please, Britta Hale. One winter, when I was young, a storm brought down 40 feet off the top of a nearby tree on my parents' property. And I was tasked with the cleanup. 
with a handsaw. It wasn't just any old handsaw. This was a two-man handsaw, the kind where you actually have to work in sync and agreement with another person. And being young, and this being a sequoia redwood tree, the situation didn't look so much like this as it looked like this. <laughs> to this day, I have no idea whether my parents tasked me with this as some sort of character development or for their own entertainment. However, you can imagine how elated I was the first time I used a chainsaw. It's fast, it's powerful. You can do things with a chainsaw you can never even dream of doing with a two-man handsaw. But with the new tool comes certain risks. If you do not understand those risks when you're the operator, you can seriously injure or maim yourself and others. Today we have a new tool, AI. It's fast. It's powerful. We can do things with AI that we can never dream of doing with our old analysis tools. But it also comes with certain risks. And if the end operator doesn't understand those risks, they also put themselves and others in the firing line. So if we talk about all these risks, we should obviously start with the most evident one, the one that's hidden in very plain sight, namely what we're trying to do with AI. When we test learning models, we're testing for something very simple and straightforward, accuracy. Does the model behave as we expect it to? What we do not test for is basically everything else. And this is where the security and the cybersecurity risks come into play. Can the model be circumvented? Can the training be affected? Can we backdoor it? Can we subvert it? Can we abuse the learning model? So while I could use this talk to discuss all the amazing applications of machine learning to cyber intelligence and cyber security, we are in fact going to focus on how we can attack the learning itself. Because that's probably going to be the back door that your attacker will be looking at as well. If we ask a machine to learn data, we have to have some sort of training sample to start with. Often this could be images, it could be other types of data, it could be location data, it could be health data, whatever it might be. And you give it to the machine and say, please, or your neural network, you say, please learn this. Drive information which I can later deduce something from. How does that learn? Well, you're not controlling every step anymore. That was the old analysis way. Now the machine is learning whatever it wants to. You give it an image. And you're hoping to later deduce or recognize people wearing glasses, for example. What does it learn? Well, it learns not only if you wear glasses, but it learns age and gender, it learns height, it learns location data, situation data, context, facial recognition. In many ways, machine learns very similarly to people. If, you ask, if I ask you to learn something, chances are you will first try to memorize it. And that's exactly what the machine is doing as well. It wants to memorize. You see this very effectively employed in language models. Uh, if you think even like Google Translate. If you give it a bunch of grammar rules to learn, you will probably not get the most effective machine. Your, your model won't be the most effective. Instead, it memorizes things. It memorizes phrases. So it can build a better and more effective output. But of course, you don't just give it one piece of data. You give it many pieces of data. And it has a perfect memory of all of these. It knows what you're doing. It knows what you're working on, those people you've talked to, those people you're around, your interests. Think of all the situational data behind every piece of actual firm hard data that you give it. There's a lot of context there, and it memorizes all of it. So then the question becomes, how can we subvert this? 
I now have a source of perfect memory of a lot of data. What can we do? And it leads us to our very first of two categories, which I'll cover today. The first one being, how do we attack during the training cycle? And we'll only look at two sub-examples of this. One is data poisoning, and the other is trojaning. So data poisoning is exactly what it sounds like. You essentially do something to the data to cause an adverse effect later on. Uh, some of these options are if you want to misclassify the data. It, these are sort of integrity attacks. So can I get the data to be misclassified? You see, or you're, you have a detection system that is, detects a bunch of objects, and instead of your models telling you that as a swarm of UAVs, it instead tells you it's a bunch of birds. Okay, so it misclassifies everything. Or perhaps it's just overall confidence level is reduced. And instead of being 80% uh, confident that it is a swarm of UAVs, it is now only 50% confident. You can also do a more targeted misclassification. If you want to say, uh, do a false alarm and say you have a group of birds and instead those are classified as UAVs. So these are all about the integrity of your model. You can also flip this and do it the other way and talk about the availability of your model. So this is taking more particular sources and readjusting them to a target. So the general category of UAVs or general category of birds, you want a particular type of bird or a particular type of UAV probably to be misclassified. Here's an example from a piece of research that was done about misclassifying pandas. Okay, well, if we can apply something to pandas, we can apply it to just about anything else, right? It's only an example. But if you have a picture that is a fairly is a mediocre confidence level there, and you add some poisoning to it. Now, it's such a small amount of poisoning, you and I can't even detect it. In fact, you probably can't see it all based on the resolution of the screen. But your model can, because it can definitely have a much higher image resolution. Now, this here is not true noise. It's carefully selected. So that's not simply random noise. It's something that was carefully selected to match this photo and you get a misclassification. You have poisoned the data. Now, these pandas are going to be misclassified as something entirely different and possibly at a much higher confidence level. How does it work? Well, it doesn't take much. As we can see here, if you move one data point, you can throw off the entire model. It's only like one data point. How much does it take? How much poisoning does it take to undermine your machine learning, your end goal? And the short answer is not much. Trojaning, backdoors. Well, this is essentially like poisoning, but more specific. It takes a little bit more planning, but you get results that are more targeted. What do you do? Well, first of all, you need to inverse a network and create what we call a Trojan trigger. So essentially something that, in reaction to a particular piece of data, will give you a misclassification, but otherwise will behave as you expect. So perhaps your model will classify all UAVs as UAVs and all birds as birds, except for that one type. That one type of UAV, that one will get misclassified. That one can go under the radar and will not be detected. So this doesn't get activated until you put in real inputs that throw off the model. The good news here, from an attacker point of view, is that you don't need access to the original data set. All right? you, don't, you don't have to access the original data set. All you're going to do is retrain with a little bit more data. So you have the model, you trained it on data, you got something out, it seems usable, and, but you know, for refinedness, you're going to allow the model to keep training, keep learning as time goes on. Now we input the Trojan and it's backdoored. What else? Well, we can actually do this quite quickly. Compared to the original training, which could take months and ages to train, now minutes, seconds, hours, not that long. It's a fast trigger. Your attack is fast, even though your planning is not. 
So for example, with this one, you can have a sort of a stop sign. Should be a stop sign, should be classified as a stop sign. Instead, this particular stop sign will be misclassified. Maybe not all stop signs will. This one will be classified as a speed limit. And of course, this could be anything we imagine. And maybe it's simply that you have a sticker on this one. All your data will classify stop signs correctly, except for the, those that carry the right mark, that carry the Trojan trigger. Now, you as a human might not be able to recognize that. This might be a very small, even a pixel level trigger. But your machine does, and they react accordingly. How do we defend? We have to defend somehow, right? Well, let's start with the most obvious version of this. If we got uh, poisoning or potential uh, Trojans out there, they should be outliers. They should be, there should be anomalies to these types of pieces of data. So let's eliminate the outliers. That should be straightforward, right? <laughs> Turns out we have issues classifying outliers. This isn't a basic statistical outlier anymore. You know, these are anomalies. What makes an anomaly? That depends on your data set. What about those Trojans? You know, do we start detecting outliers before that we have the filtering rule from the very beginning? Or were those Trojans inserted before we had the filtering rule? Also, a key point of outliers is that they tend to be the points that determine the best models. In general, we can have a general model for classifying UAVs, but those anomalies, the ones that are slightly different, you know, small, small pieces of data, just a little odd, those tend to be what refine a model down to the very best possible version. You can think of this as, uh, in terms of human context as well. It's the minority portions, the minority data that give you a bigger picture. If you limit those out and say, well, that doesn't matter, you actually are going to end up with an unfair and warped model. So maybe limiting outliers isn't so easy after all. <coughs> Newly tested data. Okay, we can, if we're going to add more data to our training pool, like for a Trojan, maybe we should test it first before we add it in to train anything on. Sounds good. But what about those Trojans? Do we really know what the trigger point is? If we don't already know what trigger point to look for, then we won't see it coming. And even if you test it against the main data set, it won't be detected. Now, all of this leads to a much bigger question in general, and that's the data. OK, so we have data. The machine has learned on data. Uh, we have data for the inference. We have data that could be poisoned. Maybe we should get rid of the part that's the biggest issue here, get rid of the data. I mean, after all, we know that data has been leaked. For example, you know the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Data gets out. Uh, it's very hard to protect data. We have big data. Oh, How do you keep it secure? We could have an entire lecture just on this. You want to talk about encryption? Got news for you on that. So I'm actually going in the opposite direction. Let's assume for a moment that you can do the impossible. You can secure your data so it never leaks. In fact, I'll do you one better. Let's pretend you can delete your data. You train your model, you delete your data, you will never retrain it. We're good. We're safe, right? No poisoning, no Trojans, all OK. Remember that little detail I mentioned at the beginning of a perfect memory? Your model memorized all that data. You might be able to get rid of the original data, but the model's still there. This leads us to the tax during production. Now that you have a model, is it still open to attack? And the first of these, being inference, is precisely the one that's most vulnerable. So inference is about acquiring data based only on the output model. So your adversary has access to the model. Maybe, maybe you put the model in a bad place. Maybe it fell into the wrong hands. They don't have access to the data. But can they reverse it? Can they figure out, for example, what that model was trained on? Not just what, not, I mean, groups of UAVs, but specific images with real data in them. Blueprints, people, 
locations. Can we reverse it? Turns out, yes, we can. This is an image given only the name of a person that the model was able to reproduce or the attacker was able to reproduce to get close to the original. The original was this. That's pretty close. And this is round one. Refine this over a few years of practice and you can imagine how accurate these images are going to become. Other types of inference. Finding out if a piece of data was in the original training set. I have a data point. Maybe or maybe not you had an image of this uh, UAV and I have a model. Let's figure out if it was in the original training set. If you are basing your assumptions <coughs> off of it, one particular piece of data. Other types of inference. Model extraction. So let's assume this is a black box. You can't get to the model as the attacker, but you can get some outputs from it. So you get a, some outputs from the model. Can you reverse this? Can you actually figure out the model itself based only on those outputs? Can you figure out what it was trained to do? And the answer is, of course, yes, you can. Evasion. There's another variant, kind of the opposite of poisoning in many ways. Poisoning is introducing poison points to the data. Evasion basically says, well, let's try the opposite approach. Let's go backwards. Let's take good data and shift it till it looks close enough to bad stuff that it will be misclassified. So if we want to classify pandas as givens, for example, instead of now changing and adding noise to the training set at all, we will simply take a bunch of photos of the gibbons and start manipulating them, making little changes here and there. But we'll keep them labeled as gibbons. That way, the model thinks it's the, right, it's the right classification. That hasn't changed at all. But we've changed them. And then, now can we get the panda to be misclassified? And a more hardcore example, Spam to not spam. So what are we doing here? We have an instance that is perfectly correctly labeled. We have another instance that is perfectly correctly labeled. We will not change the target in any way. Instead, we just introduce a few variations of the other source, the poison instances. This is a type that you don't see coming. You want to classify all your UAVs as UAVs, well, that's still happening. But now I'm going to take some images of birds and manipulate them a little bit. If I test this on the, your model, if I test it to see if it's actually having the accuracy that it's looking for, it will give me that. It will show me that it is an accurate model. But when I train all these together, the end result is exactly the opposite. How do we protect against this? Well, there's various defenses. If we're talking about the inference, we can actually talk about what's called differential privacy. Remember, inference, what is that trying to do? That's trying to infer something about the original data set without access to the data at all, based only on the model. So I need to, in some way, disconnect the original data from what is being memorized by the model. Maybe I can keep that part private. So it looks like this. Differential privacy is essentially adding a little bit of noise to all your inputs. Just a little, not enough to warp the model, but a little bit of noise to all the inputs. And then we train the model on all that, and it can operate more or less as intended, but if anyone tries to infer and go backwards, well, there's a lot of noise. It's harder to make that inference. Sounds good? Sounds like we've solved the problem? Now it's a very similar issue to the outlier situation. We have changed the finer points. Noise are always fine points. So we have changed all the critical corners of our data that define how the model works best. You're creating a disbalanced model. It could benefit you, 
but you have also put yourself at risk. So what else can we do? Well, if you're talking about evasion, maybe we simply won't force guessing. If we have a low confidence value for a particular image and it says there's a, say, 60% chance that a particular image is a UAV, we're not going to force the model to guess. We won't force it to determine anything. Instead, we'll have a sort of give up or null class where it hands it off to the human and says, you decide. I'm not convinced enough. Well, that's nice, then we're kind of going back to the beginning. It's high overhead for your human operator. It's more work. What else could we do? Adversarial training. So adversarial training is basically about building robustness into your system. The idea being, I know an adversary will eventually try to attack. So instead of just letting it choose the poison for the data, or letting it make protrusions, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to make little changes to the data. I'm going to add adversarial examples to the data and build a model that is robust against those. Theoretically, not too bad. But what if the adversary uses different examples? So you're robust against a certain type of Trojan. What about all the other types? You're robust against a certain type of poisoning. What about all the other types? What if what they're trying to target in your model isn't the same thing that you are testing against? What about the too many case? So you add adversarial examples to your uh, training pool. You're giving it poison so that it's robust against all that poison. How good is that model? Is it still as good as you wanted it to be in the first place? Or now have you warped the whole system? And this leads us basically to our final point. If I'm trying to protect against evasion attacks, I might try adversarial training. So I have tried uh, to introduce some error so it can't simply add new instances of not spam, make those uh, birds look like UAVs or vice versa. If I'm adding error, that should sound a lot like something to you. It takes us right back to the beginning. If you introduce enough adversarial training, you're actually opening the door to poisoning your data. And now we've gone full circle. So maybe there isn't a solution. In fact, there probably isn't. There isn't one solution of how we can prevent all the possible types of adversarial attacks. And there's more. These were just some examples. What do we do? Well, like with any new tool, it comes down to your end operator. It's not the person designing the tool that is going to face the most risk. Nor can they pre you prevent every possible situation and every possible misuse. When you have a new tool, it is an operator that needs to be aware of what the possible risks are, how it can be abused, how it can be misused, and be aware and ready for that. And this is a challenge that we're facing with AI in cybersecurity. <coughs> Training isn't just for the data anymore. It's for all of us. Thank you. <laughs>